Hello, everyone. My name is Amparo Galindo. I'm one of the co-directors of the Institute for Molecular Sciences and Engineering, IMSI for short. And so it's a great pleasure today to welcome you here on behalf of IMSI together with the uh, Energy Futures Lab. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the launch of our latest briefing paper uh, on sustainable, safe and sustainable lithium ion batteries. We are delighted that you can join us today for this very special event. Today marks the start of Sustainability Week for the college, and so it's especially fitting that we launch this paper today in which uh, we have looked at how to reduce the environmental impact and to improve the safety of the key components that, that are batteries for the transition uh, to new energies uh, for all of us. As uh, you know, and you are all aware of this, we have become to rely heavily on batteries uh, for our future cleaner energy from the phones that we use to laptops, electric cars, and also as solutions for electricity grids. But of course, these batteries uh, also use a large amount of raw materials, which are not easy to source or produce. And as demand for batteries uh, grows, it's important that we take time to, to consider that we don't inadvertent, inadvertently create a new environmental problem. So IMSI and, and EFL got together to collect uh, experts in the areas of, of batteries that we have in the college and to really consider a life cycle assessment of these uh, of, of batteries and uh, supply chain and really the, the value chain of batteries. And uh, so we have today two of the co-authors of the briefing paper that will give a presentation for about 20 to 25 minutes. These are Evangelos Kalitsis and Laura Lander. Thank you for being here, both of you. Thank you very much for doing this. I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. Evangelos is a PhD candidate in Imperial. He trained as a chemical engineer uh, with a specialization in process systems engineer engineering and his research combines environmental and techno-economic techno-economic modeling to study the production, use and recycling of lithium ion batteries and especially with a life cycle perspective, which is especially fitting for the theme of the briefing paper. And Laura is a postdoctoral research associate who focuses on the sustainability and techno-economics of lithium ion and next generation batteries. She has a background in both synthesis and characterization of cathode materials for lithium and sodium ion batteries. And uh, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. And uh, after the presentation, we will be joined in a panel discussion by two senior members of the staff, Professor Anna Corre and Professor Craig Offer. And uh, I'm looking forward to a very exciting discussion. Before I uh, hand over to Evangelos and Laura, just to mention to, to get involved, to use the chat, the Q&A functions, to ask any questions that you may have, and uh, we'll take it from there. So this uh, Evangelos and Laura is over to you. Sorry to interrupt, Evangelist, but your your microphone is muted. So if you could just go from the top. OK, uh, sorry about that. Um, so the presentation will go as follows. I uh, first I'm going to present an introduction, then talk about lithium ion batteries using electric vehicles and then present the sustainability part of our briefing paper. Then Laura is going to jump in to present some more aspects about recycling, battery safety, future opportunities and conclusions. Now let's uh, start by looking at this graph, which uh, shows that demand for batteries is expected to skyrocket. And this demand is uh, primarily driven by electric mobility. This is the blue part of the graph. So it's evident that we need to establish a safe and sustainable battery value chain. And this goes for the whole life cycle of batteries from materials extraction to end of life. This has been the key focus of uh, uh, this briefing paper. 
and I will elaborate further. Now, compared to uh, competing energy storage technologies, lithium-ion batteries exhibit a combination of affordability, high energy and power densities, high cycling efficiency, and improve, improved lifetime. And this makes them ideal for electric vehicle applications. Lithium-ion batteries typically consist of five key components. This is the anode, cathode, electrolyte, separator, and the current collectors. And they're often categorized based on the cathode material they include. This is what you see here. Uh, we see MCA, which stands for lithium nickel cobalt aluminum oxide, and then NMC, which goes for lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide, with varying fractions of nickel manganese and cobalt in it. So these are the two uh, main technologies for uh, electric vehicle, vehicle applications, and they're usually combined with an anode made of graphite. Now, moving on to battery sustainability, we're going to look at the whole value chain, as I said, from material extraction to end of life. Let's start by discussing ways through which battery materials are produced. And generally, with the exception of lithium, these materials are mined out of the ground, either through underground or open pit mining. And this is a process that is known to cause land use change, produce toxic waste, and also impact local ecosystems. The ores that are taken out of the ground, they're typically processed, especially for the case of nickel, cobalt, and copper, either through pyrometallurgy or hydrometallurgy. The former is known to require increased amounts of energy, which is usually satisfied through fossil fuels, while uh, hydrometallurgy uses strong acids to leach the metals, and uh, these acids are not the most environmentally friendly chemicals. Now let's talk briefly about lithium. Uh, Lithium mainly exists in uh, brine form, uh, mainly in South America, in the lithium triangle, and this is pumped usually out of the ground and gets evaporated to concentrate. And while this might sound like a more environmentally friendly process, it comes with, with, with its own sustainability concerns, such as using increased amounts of water in regions with uh, water scarcity problems, and also impacting local ecosystems. Also, we have well-established processes for producing aluminum from bauxite ore, from exam for example, and uh, we have this electrolysis step, which we know it's a very energy-consuming step. Now, uh, these are the processes that uh, occur in a, a modern-day battery gigafactory, and before I discuss about them. Let me just tell you that there is a, a step before that. Uh, this is uh, the cathode preparation process. And what happens here is that nickel, cobalt, and manganese in sulfate form are combined with lithium in either carbonate or hydroxide form to produce the cathode material. So we go for, from several compounds to the single cathode material. And uh, converting this uh, is known to require high uh, increased amounts of energy and also produces wastewater which needs to be to, to, treated, to be treated further. Now the cathode material and the anode material are coated to the foils, then they get calendared and they get dried. And the drying step is necessary because in order to coat we need a solvent and this solvent needs to be removed and uh, actually removing the solvent is uh, known to be a very expensive process both in monetary terms but also in energetically energetic terms now uh, this process sequence uh, also is performed in a dry room and uh, maintaining this dry room is uh, has been found to be one of the very energy consuming processes in battery production. Moving on to the use phase, this refers to integrating a battery to an electric vehicle and using it for several years. And we know that 
there are no direct emissions that are associated to the use phase, but the emissions can be traced back to electricity production. And this is a form of life cycle thinking. We don't, we don't only look at emissions on the spot, but throughout the value chain. Now there are big variations across different locations regarding the environmental footprint of electric vehicles. And for example, an electric vehicle in China might have a, a very different environmental profile than an electric vehicle in the UK or France. And this is simply because we have different electricity mixes. There are also battery related parameters that are relevant to this stage. This is the cycling efficiency and battery lifetime. And Laura is going to tell you more about lifetime as we have done some work together on this. So let me now show you a demonstration of uh, how the battery production carbon footprint is being or will be reduced. And this is what we see here, the carbon footprint measured in kilo, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. And uh, the first uh, uh, step is to go from gigascale plants to, from pilot scale plants, sorry, to gigascale plants. And this reduces the energy consumption and of course reduces the carbon footprint associated with it. Then we have producing more energy dense batteries and you can see the effect by comparing the first bar with the third bar. The third bar corresponds to a more energy dense battery and the environmental effect is immediately realized simply because we use less amount of material to store the same amount of energy. Finally, uh, we have powering production with renewable energy and establishing sustainable procurement. And this is simply choosing materials with lower carbon footprint. And we can see the effect of those two on the graph. The green part corresponds to, for example, using European aluminium instead of uh, uh, Chinese aluminium to produce the batteries. And then the yellow part shows reductions achieved by uh, utilizing renewable energy for battery manufacturing. So the key message of this graph is that battery production requires a lot of energy, but there are ways uh, to make it more sustainable. And these are very realistic measures that several manufacturers have been committed to. Finally, uh, battery recycling is also a way to reduce the environmental impact of the battery value chain. And this is what you see here. We have the battery production carbon footprint again, which is around 133. This is uh, slightly increased when we introduce recycling. And this is because recycling is an additional process chain that requires additional amount of energy and materials to perform. But the effect of recycling is realized when we displace the recovered material uh, the, the, the uh, pri primary material with recovered material, and we can see that this results in a 30% decrease compared to the initial footprint. Now, this graph focuses on hydrometallurgical recycling and also only discusses the carbon footprint, and there are more technologies to recycle batteries and also different sustainability aspects to consider. So now, I will uh, end my part of the presentation and I will invite Laura to tell us more about the recycling process and the safety part. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, so there are currently three main recycling processes. We have the parametallurgical process, hydrometallurgical process and direct recycling. And the figure here on the right shows the three processes starting from the end of life battery pack over the spent cell um, through the recovered materials at the bottom and the production of new cells and new packs. An end of life battery cell can either go via parametallurgical recycling, which uses high temperatures to smelter the battery materials, and then further go via hydrometallurgical process, which uses leaching and ion exchange, for instance. Um, to recover valuable materials. 
Alternatively, the spent cell can also go directly via the hydrometallurgical process or via direct recycling. Direct recycling has the advantage that it recovers the cathode material without destroying its structure and therefore makes it easily reusable for constructing a new cell and new battery pack. So recycling is a crucial step uh, in order to avoid battery waste mountains and to redu reduce safety risks, which are um, safety risks and environmental, environmental risks associated to battery landfills. And moreover, it enables to establish a circular economy by feeding the recovered materials back into the battery value chains we've seen before. However, we mustn't forget that recycling doesn't automatically mean more sustainable because, as uh, Evangelo said in the beginning, recycling also has its own environmental burdens. And those come, for example, from the toxic chemicals which are used during the leaching processes or um, through the high energy consumption during the pyrometallurgical process. And in this context, for instance, it was shown that um, hydrometallurgical and especially direct recycling are more advantageous than pyrometallurgical recycling in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. However, much more research efforts need to be invested to develop more eco-friendly and more efficient recycling processes. And one of the currently biggest challenges for battery recyclers are, first of all, the large variety of cell chemistries. We have NCAs, we have NCMs, as we saw, and also the lack of standardization and different pack designs. So besides um, the sustainability aspects throughout the battery life cycle, we also have to look at battery safety. And um, those are still huge challenges for battery researchers as well as the battery industry. And similarly to environmental impacts across the life cycle, we also have safety impacts at each state. For instance, uh, throughout raw materials extraction, the miners are having risky work conditions and also are often exposed to toxic chemicals. Further, uh, uh, during the materials processing, um, we use toxic or flammable chemicals, which are used, for instance, for the electrolytes. And also during the distribution steps throughout the um, entire value chain, um, especially damaged cells and can, uh, can lead to, um, to safety risks for battery fires and, um, and leakage of toxic chemicals. Further, also during the use phase, we have thermal runaway reactions, which I will explain in more detail in the next slide. And last but not least, um, at the end of life, degraded battery cells can lead either to battery landfill fires if they're not um, appropriately handled, or toxic chemicals can leak into the environment. And also recycling, as I said, is not uh, sustainable in itself, but also uses um, toxic and harsh chemicals. So, um, as seen in the slide before, battery ignition and battery fires are a serious safety risk throughout the life cycle and can occur during st storage, use phase and in landfills, for instance. So, battery thermal runaway it can be triggered by electrical or mechanical abuse, thermal abuse or defect cells, and defect cells and cell component failure, as shown in the, in the figure on the right. To prevent um, battery ignition, there are several safety mechanisms which are on each layer of uh, battery engineering. So either this can be on materials level, where for instance, cell materials with a higher thermal stability could be used, or also solid electrolytes. And on pack level, we have thermal management systems and battery management systems, which can um, uh, detect failure and prevent, in this case, a thermal runaway reaction. So to increase battery life cycle safety, several measures can be put in place. Firstly, to ensure safe work environment, safety protocols and controls need to be implemented and also reinforced. And also special training and equipment, as well as the use of low toxicity chemicals can increase the work environment safety for the workers. In addition, battery tracking systems and extended producer responsibility are very powerful measures to prevent batteries being inappropriately handled or also lost and um, uh, disposed of in inappropriate manners. For instance, there have been recent reports of um, warehouse, warehouse fires where batteries have been illegally stored and um, led, to, led to significant safety risks. 
Further, a standardized system for battery labeling and rigorous state of health assessments are also very important to increase the, safe, uh, the safety during the end of life handling. So this figure shows an ideal circular battery life cycle, including second life um, applications, the reusage of cells and components, and the recycling step. Um, the recycling step. So um, the establishment of a safe and sustainable battery system is a highly complex challenge and requires measures to put uh, to be put in place at each step of the of the value chain. And future opportunities to increase battery sustainability and safety include, for instance, the use of alternative chemistries on electrode and electrolyte level, as well as the development of high energy density batteries, which in turn would reduce the um, needed amount of material. Further, low impact manufacturing processes such as hydrothermal and sorbothermal um, synthesis or low temperature reactions are, um, are a way to increase sustainability as well as the upscaling of the uh, manufacturing process, as we've seen before. Further, on the design stage, design, battery pack design with end of life um, in mind is also a very important step in order to make the recycling step more efficient to facilitate second life and uh, second life applications and reusage of cells, and also to increase the um, safety of workers um, for dis disassembling the battery cells. Further, during the use phase, um, battery management systems are important, which can um, prevent thermal runaway reactions, increase the safety, but also can ensure that the, um, that the battery is used in an optimized manner and therefore can extend the battery lifetime. Further, as I mentioned, battery tracking and the battery passport are really important in order to ensure that batteries are handled appropriately at the end of life and efficient and so-called soft recycling processes, avoiding any harsh chemicals, uh, are a way to increase the end-of-life um, battery sustainability. And throughout the entire value chain, using renewable energy, as well as establishing a regional supply chain, which in turn would then um, reduce transportation distances and also would make us more independent of, um, of other uh, economies, um, increase the overall um, battery sustainability. So just to, um, uh, to go into more detail into the opportunity of lifetime extension before the end of the talk. Um, so lifetime extension is a very promising um, uh, approach to uh, um, increase battery sustainability as it can compensate for the environmental impacts incurred during early life cycle stages such as battery manufacturing and raw materials extraction. And increased battery lifetime can be either achieved through um, um, second life applications, um, which then, uh, you know, go beyond the initial application in an electric vehicle, for instance. And here also battery management systems such as thermal management, which can increase the battery lifetime, um, are very important. So here, engineering solutions are an important way for battery lifetime extension. However, also for battery lifetime extension, we have to be aware that this will lead to a slower feedback of uh, battery materials uh, back into the battery value chain and we have to see how this will impact the, um, the environmental impacts of um, uh, raw materials extraction. So this means we need to, uh, to source more materials again for battery manufacturing. So at the end of the talk I would like to, um, to summarize the, the results and the findings of our uh, white paper. So as described in the beginning, we will see an increased demand of electric vehicles and lithium ion batteries in the coming decades, which in turn requires more raw materials and energy. And we also saw that the battery value chain is highly global and complex, which, may, which means that sustainable procurement is uh, as a consequence also highly challenging. So here life cycle assessment is a very powerful tool to identify emission and energy use hotspots and to inform decision-making processes as how we can make a battery more sustainable. So just to summarize again the um, opportunities we have identified to develop a safer and more sustainable battery. So again, we have sustainable procurement across the entire value chain. Technological improvements are very important uh, on battery cell level as well as on engineering level. 
low impact manufacturing processes and uh, manufacturing upscaling. Redesigning the battery cells in packs with end of life, with end of life uh, in mind. Battery lifetime extension, battery tracking and passports, and also a sustainable and environmentally friendly recycling process. So just to summarize again, the, the most important messages of, um, uh, of our briefing paper. So we saw that indeed we need a more sustainable battery technology in order to secure a sustainable energy future. And also uh, a realization we had is that battery safety and sustainability often go hand in hand. So by solving one problem, often we also tackle the other one. And in the end, life cycle assessment and safety improvements are crucial steps in order to ensure a safe and sustainable battery. So at this stage, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and um, looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much for yeah. this. And thank you, Evangelos, for the very nice presentation too on our white paper. Uh, the message, of course, is loud and clear. Uh, sustainability and safety are critical for the success and wider social acceptability of lithium ion batteries, and particularly for their use in transport and other applications. And uh, thank you also for highlighting that there are still important challenges to overcome, as well as opportunities. Now, I hope that uh, Greg is going to talk in a moment about uh, uh, the important challenges uh, that scientists and engineers uh, are uh, focusing on, uh, particularly on developing and improved uh, batteries, technologies and materials, and also methods to manage the batteries uh, during the different stages in their lives, as well as in recycling. Uh, from my point of view, uh, my, my group's work focuses on uh, supporting governments and policymakers who need uh, reliable and accurate information uh, to support their decision uh, making. Uh, where should we be sorting uh, primary role that we need uh, uh, service? How should we be managing the threat in our markets within batteries that are in use? Uh, first, uh, life use currently, but uh, soon in a few years, maybe also in the second life you, uh, use and uh, maybe available also for recycling. Should we be sending them back to the producers somewhere else in the world or should, should we tr be trying uh, to keep them in our uh, uh, society and actually use them uh, so that we uh, make sure that uh, we are not suffering from security of supply issues? Um, uh, our team's work also focuses on um, uh, supporting uh, decision making for industry uh, who are being asked to make uh, huge uh, investments in uh, gigafactories in order to reduce uh, the footprint of batteries, as you have uh, rightly showed us, and uh, need to make these decisions in a very fast moving uh, uh, marketplace. Um, what I would like to say last. Uh, uh, for our audience to contemplate um, and also considering uh, all the latest the news that we have and the uh, difficulties we are facing um, in society. Um, uh, the perspectives and interests of different governments and different industries around the world are not the same. Um, I, and it is up to us uh, scientists and engineers and especially in academia uh, to provide uh, accurate information to uh, governments and policymakers, and evidence that allows us to compare different options, um, uh, options of uh, focusing on uh, batteries for mobility and options for maintaining our dependence on fossil fuel, which uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, we cannot uh, necessarily secure for a very long time. Uh, with these thoughts, I would like to invite uh, Greg to also uh, say a few words to uh, uh, let's bring the audience into questions. Thank you, Anna, and also thank you uh, for Laura and Evangelos, our very capable speakers. Um, so just to second what Anna just said, we need to move more rapidly away from burning fossil fuels in combustion engines. We know this is already causing an environmental catastrophe. 
However, we must not trade one environmental disaster for another, particularly if we are already aware of the potential for negative consequences. We know electric vehicles reduce emissions from the vehicle and they improve air quality where they are used. And in most countries around the world, they already reduce emissions overall. However, all of the technologies, not just batteries required for the energy transition, require materials which have to be dug out the ground, products to be manufactured which require energy, and they have to be disposed of at the end of life. This must all be optimised both to maximise jobs, wealth creation and economic development, but also to reduce the negative environmental health and societal impact. So in my group, um, we do a lot of work on the engineering, um, trying to translate the scientific understanding of how a battery works and then communicate that with the engineers. Increasingly, we're seeing demand from the engineers to help them both understand and optimise their supply chains and also to optimise the design of their products to ensure that they're both recyclable or reusable, uh, depending upon the application. I think there's a lot more work to be done on this. Battery demand is growing exponentially. We're expecting what is probably already a many multiples of a hundred billion dollar industry to probably become a multiple trillion dollar industry by the end of this decade. We're looking at the material flows, the supply chains that exist now being an order of magnitude smaller than they will be. Therefore, the material flows, the amount of material needed in the in the ecosystem cannot sustain the future ecosystem. So we need to up, we do need to dig a lot more material out the ground, but we also need to work out what to do with it when we've dug it out the ground and not just throw it back into a different hole in the ground. And I think that is the main thing we're trying to avoid. So on that note, I will I will stop talking and we'll hand, over, hand back over to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent introduction, Evangelis and, and Laura. And thank you for the uh, summary remarks that is you know, really exciting and really interesting. I think I will start with taking some of the questions. I have quite a few of my own, but I'm going to let, let's see what the audience, they probably know a lot more than me. So let's see, there's really a lot of debate out there. So that's very interesting. Let me start with the first one. Uh, Andrew Goddard asks uh, about biological methods for recovery. I don't know who wants to answer that. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. Yeah. Thank so, you, Laura. There are research efforts to, to develop um, biological recovery methods for batteries. However, those are still in the very early development stages on lab scale. So there, it's not really an industrial process at this stage. And we are more, or in industry, we see more the, the pyrometallurgical and hydrometallurgical processes I've described before. So there are pushes towards biological methods, but just because they avoid harsh, harsh chemicals and are less energy intensive. Um, but as I said, it's still very early stages. Mm -hmm. And I guess in, in, in terms of challenges for biological uh, recovery, because it sounds, you know, like really a very good idea. When I saw the question, I thought, yes, actually that, that could really help the very intensive process of recycling the battery. So what are the big challenges for, you know, biological recovery, you know, for people that might want to go into that research area? That might be a difficult question, Laura, or maybe someone else wants to answer that. Yeah, Greg, go ahead. I, I can probably comment. Um, so in the biological methods, uh, with, without having done a comprehensive literature review of my own to be up to date on the topic, I would imagine the challenges are that once you've got metallic ions in solution in an in a, in a aqueous solution, then a biological method may be appropriate. But there's a lot to be done before you get to that point and some of the other materials in the battery are likely to be highly toxic to any biological organisms. So until you've got a relatively clean metal ions in solution, um, then you know there's a lot of steps before you can even begin to consider using biological processes. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense actually. I had completely imagined exactly what you described, an echo solution with the ions, and I thought, yeah, that sounds like a really good plan, of course. <laughs> But it's difficult to get to that point. OK, let me pass you the next question. Um, so uh, Nicole Meltzak uh, asks, 
about recyclability, of which you know you have talked a lot, and clearly you know it's a big issue with the batteries. And uh, I think we're all glad that you know, and of course, in the life cycle analysis, is is about how much energy do we use recycle, of course, how much energy to make them, and then how much energy to recycle them. So on recyclability. Uh, she asks, do you think many organizations would go for a standardized cell designs? And, and she says, you know, she imagines there will be a lot of IP issues uh, related to, of course, sharing information would be ideal, but, you know, how are we, you know, what are the best ways to progress, to progress that? And again, uh, Anna, do maybe you I can have a question. Question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, of course, uh, uh, the design of batteries is very important, but then uh, a lot of uh, teams are working on developing recycling methods that are not so very specific on a particular type of battery. And, and uh, 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 the other uh, consideration is that, uh, of course, we have not had very many batteries available for recycling because really the recycling will uh, be a lot more efficient when we have substantial amounts, which will actually help us to reduce significantly the cost uh, of recycling. Um, so I don't think that uh, really the competition between the IPs is so much on um, uh, between the industry uh, uh, companies. It's not so much on uh, uh, their own technology and, and trying to to not really reveal it so that the recycling can progress. I think they are a lot more focused on the performance of their product. Uh, during uh, its use rather than uh, how it is going to be uh, performing during uh, recycling. But uh, definitely the focus of the recycling community is on developing methodologies that are going to be uh, applicable for a wider range of uh, batteries uh, rather than just one specific. Yeah, I can add something. Um, so I, I I would totally agree with 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 Anna. I think because of the behaviour of the cell manufacturers and users that uh, Nicole, essentially, you're right. They don't want to get trapped into having to manufacture their competitors' design. This means the the recycling industry is having to you know take a a form factor or even a you know application agnostic approach you know basically they'll take anything because they have to take anything <laughs> um, in the future you know we're talking decades away we may be able to optimize the system but our own research in in my research group demonstrates that nearly every battery cell design pack design product design is very suboptimal so there are huge opportunities over the next decade or two to design far superior um, cells and products based around those cells. So if we locked in now, we would be foolish. Okay, it's back to me. Uh, there was a related question. I think uh, I think this is a short answer, but so a related question is. What is the current status of large scale battery recycling? Is it on an industrial level? I think from what you're saying, the answer is to that is yes already. But ah, so actually the answer is no. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I I would think not not in a in a very large scale. It's probably small scale at the moment. And uh, of course, uh, battery re recycling for different types of batteries, uh, lead acid batteries is uh, quite uh, advanced, but uh, for lithium ion batteries, uh, the cost is still uh, quite substantial. And I wouldn't say that uh, it is uh, very mature uh, yet. Greg may also wish to, to comment on this. Yeah, I think, yeah. And I think Evangelos wanted to make a point. Yes, go ahead, yeah, Evangelos. Just to, to add to this, um, currently uh, battery recycling for electric vehicles, uh, there is not enough feedstock to, to perform it at scale because, you know, electric vehicles got commercialized after 2010. So we know from research that we've done with Laura and Professor Offer as well that batteries stay on a vehicle for 10 or 20 years. So it will take a while until we see large amounts of feedstock available for recycling. Yeah, it's th this is actually um, th this is sorry, I'm just waiting for my screen to go red. This this is a big challenge from a, um, a marketing and a PR point of view, because actually 
you know, we're selling a lot of electric vehicles and that's going to go exponential over the next decade. But there's but the lag in investment for building the recycling facilities necessarily has to be about 10 years behind because we have to wait for those waste streams to be there. Otherwise, there's no point building a factory if you're not, you know, a, a recycling facility if you're not going to use it for 10 years. Um, that leaves the industry open to a lot of criticism that, well, how can you guarantee these processing uh, sites are going to be built? How can you ensure that that investment is going to be made? Um, so a lot of it's got to be based upon trust unless government provides those guarantees. Um, and, and it's not an easy answer to to an, an easy question to answer because, you, you know, I, I've tried to answer this with friends and say, trust us, we'll do the right thing. And that's really hard <laughs> for people to believe. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, so related comment continues with the conversation. Greg. Uh, Billy Wu asks, he, he says, uh, nice talk. Can you provide perspective on cost effectiveness of the different recycling approaches? I think it's exactly what you're saying. So maybe you can give us a bit uh, of, uh, of an insight there. He says, do people make money from recycling and which is the most cost effective approach? Uh, I would let Laura answer this one. It's a good idea. Thanks. Um, yeah, to, to answer Billy's questions um, and also to, to get back to what uh, Greg said before, uh, people don't make uh, make any profit from recycling right now because just the scale is too low, there's no economies of scale, we don't have the feedback, uh, the feedstock and um, also the investment of recycling the battery uh, right now is too high just because we have to transport it, for example, from the UK to to recycling in, um, facilities in China, which is extremely expensive. Um, maybe recycling there is less expensive, but um, selling the materials it doesn't make up for all the costs we have to put in up front. So there are um, strategies to optimize the, the costs of recycling in the future. For example, if we would consider more in-country recycling, so this would reduce the transportation distances and transportation costs, and also use um, recycling processes which um, uh, recover more valuable materials such as cobalt. So for example, here direct recycling is a very good approach because it recovers the um, cathode material as it is and makes it easily sellable and reusable. Um, also, for example, if we talk about disassembly costs, um, it's still a huge point because it requires a lot of um, labor hours, so this is expensive. And so, yeah, I think that along the, the recycling chain, there are a lot of optimization points um, which, will, which will come into play as soon as we have the economies of scale, if we have the feedstock of batteries to have a large scale recycling industry. Yeah, if I may chip in as well um, uh, here. Uh, so as you probably have uh, heard in, in recent uh, months, uh, some of the producers are actually uh, planning to integrate recycling within the production process, which is um, uh, a lot more uh, promising. And uh, uh, it depends also how the crediting for the recycling uh, activity works. Because if people are trying to make money out of the recycling and we see it as an isolated element of the value chain, then uh, this probably is not going to ever make uh, a very large uh, financial benefit. But if it becomes part of the production process, if it is a requirement, uh, uh, um, a legal requirement to actually recycle those batteries because they cannot be dumped, then it becomes instead of a, of a problem uh, at the end of the pipe to do something with the, with the batteries, it becomes actually a, a solution that uh, is uh, uh, providing an income for the companies uh, who are actually integrating the recycling within their production process. And we hope that this is what we're going to convince uh, uh, people uh, to do. Uh, having seen that uh, the footprints of uh, nearly all the environmental impact categories uh, uh, are improved substantially. 11 out of 13 that Vangelis has uh, recently evaluated um, uh, so significant improvements. And uh, maybe he also ought to comment uh, here, uh, Vangelis, if you may, on uh, the differences that we see when recycling takes place in different parts of the world. 
how things uh, work out. Yeah, I can, I can comment on that. So uh, recycling, as we discussed throughout the presentation, especially pyrometallurgical recycling requires big amounts of energy. And, uh, you know, when you recycle uh, in China or recycling in Europe, you have different energy profiles that, of course, will affect the, the, the burden that the battery recycling introduces. But also, uh, recycling displaces primary material and a material in, uh, say, uh, in China again, compared to a material produced to lithium produced in uh, Latin America, will have different environmental profiles and uh, this also causes a difference in the benefit, the overall benefit of battery recycling. Continue. There's one more comment on uh, recycling, and then maybe we can uh, move to. There's a couple of other very interesting questions in the chat. So on recycling, uh, Amruta asks if there are any process simulations for battery recycling processes in the absence of avail availability of feedstocks. Uh, I, I know people who are dreaming about this in in Europe. Uh, so there are a number of groups uh, in Europe who are working on this uh, uh, concept. It's still early, early, early work and very competitive amongst the different groups. I wouldn't risk to make a comment on which ones seem to be uh, most promising. Okay. Very interesting. Um, so changing topic slightly. Uh, there's a comment in the chat uh, on solid state lithium batteries. Would, uh, can you comment on their sustainability and are they safer or less safe than the current lithium batteries that we have, that the ion batteries? I don't know who wants to answer that. Evangelis. Evangelos, sorry. I can have a go on that. Uh, so solid state batteries uh, usually have improved, like say we commercialize solid state batteries tomorrow, they will probably have improved energy densities. And the research has shown that when you have an improved energy density, you use less amount of material. And this is very favorable from an environmental perspective. But as far as I'm aware of, they, they, have, they, they haven't reached commercial level yet, most of the solid state batteries out there. Yeah, I'll I'll briefly comment on solid state. So the solid state batteries, um, uh, they, they as as Ev Evangelist has said, you know they they they, they haven't reached volume commercialization yet. Um, they they are on an upward trajectory, but it's going to take many years um, before they are even in a position where they're competing before they even before they even get a chance of displacing uh, incumbent lithium ion. Um, so there's a lot of hype. So I think we're talking about, you know, 10 year time lag between the sort of like the volumes of lithium ion batteries reaching recycling. Obviously, power electronics, laptops, you know, power tools, whatever, those volumes are already being recycled. Uh, but for the solid state, we're looking at 10 years before the volumes are significant at best. So 20 years or more before you have to start recycling significant volumes of solid state batteries. Thank you. I'm going to uh, again on the topic of recycling and then there's a few questions on safety. So maybe we can then change. But on recycling, there's a question asking if it's theoretically possible in the future to reach a point of equilibrium with physical materials, such that we have no new mining, just energy. I think this, <laughs> I'm a thermodynamicist, I think this violates the second law of thermodynamics, but I will read it to you. No new mining, <laughs> just energy with the storage materials in a circular cycle. It will be amazing. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is unrealistic, uh, especially if we consider that we expect uh, the use and the need for lithium ion batteries and for batteries as a whole to 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 increase. I think it, it will not be 
it will not be something that we have in equilibrium. I think we may, we are making choices in society. We decide which uh, raw materials to extract at higher rates when we perceive that the damage that we cause on the environment and the ecosystem and human health is least. And currently, of course, there is a lot of discussion about climate change being a global problem that we have to address urgently because we are going to lock ourselves in a very difficult situation in, in, in the not too distant uh, future. But uh, while doing this, we are obviously trading with um, uh, a depletion of uh, raw materials that might not be very abundant. And we are trading this with increased environmental footprint, uh, which might be localized in places where these raw materials are, are extracted. And typically, I must say that in Europe, specifically in Europe, but also to some extent in North America, we are not producing these materials in vast amounts. They come from other countries in South America, in Africa, in Australia, and um, they are, I would say, quite far from, from us in Europe in some uh, regard. And uh, maybe this burden shift is also not necessarily fair. Uh, so there is a, a decision to, to be made, and um, I, I wouldn't uh, want to necessarily say which, which evil I prefer. And, uh, and uh, for people who are working on sustainability assessment like us, the, the, the highest priority is to make sure that we provide robust evidence uh, that is accurate on the actual footprint for the value chains that we are considering. So I'll, I'll say some words. Um, so, I mean, we're often impressed greatly when scientists mimic nature. You know, and nature is is the world's best at circular economies. You know, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, they've been, you know, some of them have been running for billions of years, um, not just millions. So we need, you know, as as a species to 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 learn those lessons. Otherwise we we learn the hard, you know, we should learn it the easy way, which is by understanding the science and 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 believing our own evidence before we have to learn the hard way from the unintended consequences. Um, I think we, we we should be striving towards as as close to 100% circular economy as we can. Um, it is theoretically possible if you're talking about material flows, as long as you've got a continuous input of free energy. Um, otherwise, yes, you're violating the laws of thermodynamics. Um, but as long as the sun is burning, <laughs> then we have a source of free energy, so we should be able to do it. Thanks. When? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can we predict when we might be? I was thinking exactly about the sun when you were thinking about talking about life and learning from the world. I was thinking there is a big source of energy that we have out there. So uh, that's what, it's what, what, what I would say is um, also the I think the challenge, therefore, that the challenge, therefore, is not science and engineering. It's actually economics and business models. You know, how do we you know, over the next 20 years, we need to dig more stuff out of the ground and we need to increase the amount of materials in the ecosystem. And then at some point, we need to be able to incentivize those companies to stop digging stuff out of the ground and instead focus on recycling and reuse. So how do we develop those business models? Because once the incumbents have got going with an extraction industry, they're going to be reluctant to strand those assets and move to a different business model. So I think that's going to be the biggest challenge in in 20 years time. Thank, thank you, Craig. Yeah, that's a very fair point, and it, it links very well to a question that has, you know, just arrived. Uh, Clement Chung asks, what is the size of the global market for each life cycle sector related to the battery supply chain? So I think it's exactly what you're talking about. Economics are, are really the key, and doing this uh, life cycle analysis as you have done in the paper, he says, and he says, a key question for governments and policymakers, especially at the local government level where I work, where he works, is how green jobs can boost local workforce and economic development opportunities for our communities. For example, we are heavily recruiting lithium battery recycling startups as part of a regional economic development strategy. I don't know if you want to comment further on, on that, any of you. Laura, I don't know if you want to comment on that one. No. Evangelos. 
Just uh, regarding the global market for its life cycle stage, I mean, we have the production stage and the materials production stages, which, I mean, they're quite big. I mean, uh, producing nickel, copper, uh, lithium, all these uh, industries have been quite mature. Then I would say we have battery production industries, which they exist, and there is also huge amounts of investment in the producing batteries. So we're going to see in the next 10 or 15 years, we're going to see many uh, plants coming to the pipeline. And then regarding recycling, the industry is not there yet. So there are uh, uh, companies which raise funds and try to, to establish sustainable recycling operations, but they're not commercialized at scale yet. Thank you. Very interesting. And I'm, a, I'm aware of time, so we have uh, about five minutes and there's a, there's a couple of questions on safety. So just take, you know, changing topics slightly. Uh, there's a quick question on uh, very interesting. How safe are lithium batteries in the home, particular, particularly regarding fire? So I, I can say a few words. Um, so I, I think I wrote in the comments, you know, you, you need to rely upon your, your standards and testing agencies to ensure uh, unsafe products are not being sold. But even then, you know, sometimes manufacturers get things wrong. You know, over the years, there have been a number of incidents when mobile phones or laptops have caught fire. Um, you know, it's cost some big companies billions of dollars um, to put things right. So there's always a risk um um and and we take that risk so mainly it's about buying uh products that have gone through proper testing and certification processes so the chances of a failure is low and then follow the instructions you know use the charger that comes with the device don't 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 hack it and plug something else in and overcharge it or don't leave it in the sunshine and let it get hot you know some simple rules and if it starts swelling get rid of it very quickly Thanks, Greg. And related to safety, we also have a question, uh, a question from Peter. Um, I don't have the surname here. Who, if I understand the question, uh, is with MTA Metro North Railroad in New York City, and uh, he asks or he comments on the fact that they they're seeing more and more uh, battery-powered uh, devices, of course, in in the trains, a, a bit like we see in London, I guess, e-bikes, e-scooters, and so on. And he asks if you can comment on how to, you know, the risks of these devices on, on trains were in, uh, out there and mitigation initiatives uh, that should be considered and implemented as we facilitate this change in how we move, I guess. I don't know if anyone wants to take this question. <laughs> I can I can comment again. Okay, go ahead. Craig. Uh, so yeah, I mean, again, it's reliant upon safe products being sold. Um, I would say, you know, in a public space where you have customers who can bring whatever they like with them, then it's going to be really challenging. Um, so I think, you know, focus on the things you can control um, rather than things you can't control. So staff training. Um, understanding what the consequences are, how to clean up, how to protect the other customers. Uh, I, I would focus on the things I could control rather than things I can't. Thanks. So <clears throat> those were a couple of questions that we had on safety and discussions. Uh, we're back to, to recycling. Let me maybe ask you a final question. Can you comment? Uh, so we've talked quite a lot about recycling. Can you comment on the potential of life extension of batteries? What technologies are there and what is the potential of that? Vangelis, do you want to answer that one? Thank you. Yeah, so I think there was uh, also a question related to that about recommissioning the the batteries. So mm -hmm. uh, 
lifetime so when a battery reaches the end of life in an electric car it has 80 percent of its capacity le left in it so giving it a second life is very favorable from an environmental perspective and people should try to do that and this should not be confused with recycling the battery because even if you use it for a second life then eventually it can be recycled so this might cause some kind of a time lag between uh, when the battery reaches end of life and when it gets recycled but uh, they are both favorable process second life and recycling and they can also occur at the same for the same battery and like there are many ways to, to extend the, the, the life cycle. I mean, they can, they can be used in uh, lower uh, uh, like power applications such as energy uh, grid storage, for example. And we have listed several ways in the briefing paper, actually. Yeah, I think there are also a lot of engineering solutions which you can use to extend the battery life cycle and or lifetime. And also it really depends on how you use your battery in um, in your car, for example, like how do you charge it? Um, what are the environmental conditions? Um, so there are a lot of you know, factors which play into battery life um, lifetime. And, but yeah, a question which comes more and more often now is again, um, the time lag of a second life uh, for a battery and feeding the, the recovered materials back into the, the battery value chain. And I think especially now that the production or the demand for lithium ion batteries is so high, um, I think it's really a big question if it's worth having a second life for batteries or if it's better if we recycle them immediately. Um, yeah, and maybe before we finish, I will ask you a slightly left field question. What about other ions that are not lithium? What is the potential there? You know, is there much work? Does it have to be lithium? Um, so I could comment briefly on this. So there's a lot of research um, on sodium ion batteries, for instance, um, which um, also are hitting commercial levels now. There, um, there are several companies which uh, which announced large scale production of sodium ion batteries, and um, but of course, the applications are slightly different than lithium ion batteries. So they're uh, most commonly used in grid storage applications, maybe smaller um, like e-bikes e and these kind of things. Um, so I think going towards next generation beyond lithium ion batteries is a really good way to, um, to um, find a good equilibrium between which battery technology is, is best suited for which application and kind of diversify the market a little bit take pressure off um, critical raw materials such as lithium, cobalt, and um, yeah, just to, to try out new alternatives. It's, there's no one fit for all. Um, there, we need several technologies, and um, I think there's a lot of um, rapid developments in terms of next generation technologies, which is very interesting. Fantastic. Thank you, Laura. That was a very nice summary. I don't know if uh, you want to make any last final remarks, any of you or each of you. If this was, I, I found it really interesting. Do you have any final comments? No. OK, okay so with this, then then uh, it's, it's back to me. So uh, I would like to thank you, the panelists. First of all, Laura, Evangelos, uh, Greg, and Anna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the amazing work in putting the briefing paper to, together. I've, you know, I've read the pre-draft. Uh, the rest of the audience, thank you very much for joining us today and for joining a really exciting discussion. The, you have a link to the briefing paper in the chat. I hope you can see it. Uh, if you have any difficulty accessing, contact the Energy Futures Lab or uh, the people at IMSI, and we're happy to, to deliver it to you. Um, and other um, information from me is just to tell you that, as I said at the beginning, we are on the sustainability week in the college, and so there will be plenty of events. So please visit uh, the web page of the college, imperial.ac.uk forward slash sustain sustainable imperial, and follow there the many activities that are going on this week. 
and in particular on Wednesday, IMSI and the Transition to Zero Pollution Initiative will host uh, another panel, this time on the topic of air pollution in London. So this affects all of us <laughs> in, in college, and I think that will be also very exciting. So join us if you can. And uh, this is all uh, for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Bye-bye.